Extraordinary Phenomenon Investigations Council presents Epic Voyages. Come join us as we enter and experience the great mysteries of the world with tonight's host, Alan B. Smith. Greetings to you all from my favorite town, New York City. This is Epic Voyages Radio, broadcasting to the world and beyond on the Inception Radio Network and rebroadcast Fridays at 6 p.m. ET on the Dark Matter Digital Network. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight as we speed through the usual cosmic field of paranormal landmines. I'm your host, Alan B. Smith. So pull up a log and get comfy around this paranormal campfire that is Epic Voyages Radio. Um, in just a bit, our guest tonight is the great Nick Redfern, author of Bloodline of the Gods, and um, the question is, what's in your blood? And who did what to your blood? Um, and as we traverse the paranormal plane tonight, be sure to check out our newly relaunched website at www.epicvoyagers.com, as well as our Epic Voyagers YouTube account for new videos, including the short At Home With series with interviews with Epic members Jim Mars, Nick Redfern, who's here tonight, Tom T. Moore, and Dr. Aaron Judkins as we continue to post them. Um, also, you can follow us on Instagram at Epic Voyages Radio and on Twitter, which is at Epic Voyagers. Um, and also, I just wanted to add tonight, I don't think we've mentioned this in a while. If you have personally had a paranormal experience, um, including UFO sightings, abductions, cryptozoological or ghostly encounters, um, and you feel that they should be investigated, you can go to our website at Epic Voyagers to report the event. And uh, Epic founder and author uh, and former Texas State MUFON director Ken Cherry, um, who leads the inve investigations, will look into your report for you and get back to you as soon as he can. Um, we have a great team of investigators that look into that. And, um, I know Nick Redfern is also part of the Epic team. Um, he's done a lot for Epic. Um, and actually, I don't know if you guys have heard about this article yet um, about the Homo naledi, which is um, apparently a new Homo erectus species, part of the Homo genus, humans. Um, so this from the New York Times, uh, quote, Acting on a tip from Spelunkers two years ago, Scientists in South Africa discovered that the cavers had only dimly glimpsed through a crack in the limestone wall deep in the rising star cave, lots and lots of old bones. The remains covered the earthen floor beyond the narrow opening. This was, the scientists concluded, a large, dark chamber for the dead of a previously unidentified species of the early human lineage, Homo naledi. The new hominin species was announced on Thursday by an international team of more than 60 scientists led by Lee R. Berger, an American paleoanthropologist who is a professor of human evolution studies at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Uh, the species name, H. Naledi, refers to the cave where the bones lay undisturbed for so long. Quote, Naledi means star in the local Sesotho language. Uh, and two Two papers published this week in the open access journal eLife, the researchers said that more than 1,550 fossil elements documenting the discovery constituted the largest sample for any hominin species in a single African site, and one of the largest anywhere in the world. Um, so the finding, like so many others in science, was the result of pure luck, followed by considerable effort. You can read more about this from the New York Times column online. And it just, you know, it got me thinking, because every once in a while we get these updates about new species or debates over certain species. And I was just curious, how many are actually out there? So I, I looked it up, and it looks like there are approximately nine species of human. Um, so really quick, so I don't bore you. I'm going to list them off for you. Homo habilis, Homo rudofensis, Homo erectus. Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens adultu, Denisova hominins, Homo sapiens sapiens, which would be us. And then there's the controversial 
um, Homo florensiensis, aka the Hobbit, which would make nine if if scientists agree that that, that is in fact part of the um, Homo genus. Um, and I was really excited to see this article because we're interviewing Nick tonight about our ancient past, our evolution. Where did we come from? How did we get to be Homo sapiens sapien? And why are some of us a little bit different than others? Why do some others have a difficulty in giving birth? Why are they rejecting their own fetuses? And this all lies within what's happening in our blood. And Nick Redfern has done a fantastic job of researching this um, for us tonight. Um, but before we get to Nick, later on in the last half hour of the show, um, feel free to call in if you want to ask Nick Redfern any questions. Open lines will be in the last half hour of the show. That line is 888-919-2355. Again, 888-919-BELL. And then press option number one. Or you could use Skype. Um, you can call the Skype name, which is Inception Radio Network. Um, so, Nick Redfern is a prolific author, alternative researcher, and EPIC member. He is the author of A COVID Agenda, The FBI Files, Cosmic Crashes, Strange Secrets, and Andy Roberts, Three Men Seeking Monsters, Body Snatchers in the Desert, On the Trail of the Saucer Spy, Celebrity Secrets, Man Monkey, Mon Memoirs of a Monster Hunter, There's Something in the Woods, Science Fiction Secrets, Contactees, Monsters of Texas with Ken Gerhardt, Final Events, The NASA Conspiracy, Space Girl Dead on Spaghetti Junction, The Real Men in Black, Keep Out, The Pyramids and the Pentagon, The World's Weirdest Places, Wild Man, Monster Diary, Sinister Tales of the MIB, Monster Files, Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, The Zombie Book with Brad Steiger, For Nobody Eyes Only, and Secret History. Nick, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, Alan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you. You the amount of work that you have done is 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 almost ridiculous. It's amazing. Well, I mean, I've actually sort of been writing in this field for probably like twenty five years. So, you know, I've, yeah, I've done about thirty books, but that's sort of about one a year, you know. So, uh, which if you span it out, kind of like that, it's actually. Uh, <laughs> it's not that strange, I guess, when you when you look at it from that perspective. True, good point. But from from my perspective, for me, that's no, I couldn't do it. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So you are a body of knowledge, that is for sure. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking about your book, Bloodline of the Gods. Um, can you just quickly tell us what the premise of this book is? Well, yeah, the, the book's basically a study of people who have what's called RH negative blood, uh, you know, which we can get into what that actually means and or implies. And um, it's a study of how, or the, the study of the theories that have been put forward to suggest that early humans may have been genetically altered by extraterrestrials, and that alteration may have led us to what we are today. In other words, that direct intervention has had a an equally direct effect upon us and our history. And so because it's a controversial story, you know, I, the whole point is to sort of look for threads and leads and information that potentially can um, vindicate the story to the extent that we're able to, you know, when you're dealing with something that's potentially tens and te tens and tens of thousands of years ago. Right. And in reference to this article that I actually just read, so where where does this split in the bloodline come? I mean, are we talking about pre-Homo sapien, or is this somewhere along the Homo sapien line this came in? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to be sort of further, you know, um, in, not further back, but, you know, sort of closer to, to the, uh, the present era. I mean, the, the article's an important one because what it actually demonstrates is that there are, or there have been, you know, various kinds of human over, you know, the mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of years and millions of years now. One of the most important things that this demonstrates is that we really don't have a full understanding of our history and our origins. You know, mm -hmm. new things are always cropping up. I mean, you made a, a very good example with the story of the Hobbit, you know, this um, dwarfish type of humanoid that nobody knew a single thing about. And yet today we're told that um, it's probably fairly highly evolved, you know, may have used tools, spears, had fire, a language, uh, for all intents and purposes, was, was a human species, but just of a, you know, a very short stature. Um, 
And if somebody had probably said that 20 years ago and that we would find examples of it, they probably mm-hmm. would have been laughed at. You know, there's no proof that there's no, th- no chance that, you know, in the early years of the 21st century or the latter part of the 20th century that we could have overlooked something like this, something so yeah, important, that, that, but we that, did. Yeah, that makes sense. That's I mean, exactly. if you look back in the 80s, I mean, Lucy was the big deal, right? There wasn't really much else going yeah. on yeah. besides, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is something we always need to remember is that Science is very good often at sort of solving things and understanding what's going on. But scientists are also very often guilty of making proclamations based upon their sort of lofty conception that they cannot be wrong. You know, that, that's the one thing I have wrong, one issue I have with the scientific community is there's nothing wrong with having, you know, uh, strongly held beliefs based upon scientific studies but you sometimes find that scientists are the w- absolute worst people for not being open to things that are outside of their particular area. I mean, you know, and they take the egotistical approach, well, I'm Professor so-and-so with all these letters after my name, so how could I be wrong, you know? And that's why, I think that's why, slightly off topic, but why people in the scientific communities dismiss things like, Bigfoot and the abominable snowman because they've studied other primates, they've perhaps studied the areas, and they're confident that because they've studied it and there's no evidence, that means there is no evidence, and that's what we're up against sometimes. Well, I wonder if the paleontologists now take a page from um, archaeologists, and mm. with the Hobbit, for instance, there was actually stories from the local tribes, you know, aka myths, yeah. right? Yeah. So there was a, a myth there, and then, you know, behind the myth, there was some sort of reality. Um, scientifically based reality. And um, I wonder if archaeologists and paleontologists now think in those terms when they're looking at the human um, history as far as our physiology and and evolution. Well, you know, I would hope so. I mean, I I would hope that not only do we learn a lot about, you know, this newly discovered creature Mm -hmm. and one of our ancient ancestors, but I would hope that within those communities that people would realize that you know, we're still making amazing discoveries in today's world, the sort of discoveries, as I said, that people would just write off 20 years ago, and certainly, the, you know, the Hobbit story. Um, and, and, and I think not only is it important to remember that, but it's important to remember if this can happen sort of twice in the last 10 years, you know, the new story, the Hobbit story about 10, 12 years ago, whatever it was, it could happen again and again and again. So I think we need to be open to the idea that we don't know everything that's going on or has gone on in the past. We largely have an interpretation based upon the data we've found, but that doesn't mean that that's all the data there is to be found, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, and the data that you've looked at, basically what you're saying is that we are, or some of us, have a bloodline directly from a non-earthling, correct? Well, yeah, I mean, I point out in the book, I mean, one of the most important things to to note is that it's a theory. I mean, obviously, when Mm -hmm. we're dealing with something that goes back tens of thousands of years, um, we're sort of reliant upon the the translation and interpretation of ancient texts and oral law and things like this. Uh, But what I try to point out in the book and to do is to tell people that, yes, this is a theory. However, if there is suggestive data and suggestive facts that add weight to the theory, then that is an important issue. You know, I wouldn't have written the book at all if it was just based upon a theory and there was nothing, you know, to support the idea that the RH negatives were in any way different, because it would be just pointless. But when you can point out, you know, there are certain issues that push it down this particular pathway, then I think it is a story worth telling, providing you demonstrate to people that, you know, it's it's not a belief system. Mm-hmm. It's a theory based on an evaluation of available evidence. You know, I don't believe in, <laughs> no pun intended, I don't believe in having belief systems. If you believe in something without evidence of its existence, right. you know, that, that that's stupid. But if you're honest enough to admit that you're dealing with something that could be real and you try and look for data to support that theory. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, that's, what, that's the problem I have with religion. 
you know, it's all belief driven. Doesn't mean so, there's no life after death, but be honest about the fact that it's a belief, you know. So for you the belief is in in the theory and the possibility and not saying that this is a fact. Um and I, I mean, I can, I can understand that, you know, a lot of yeah. people... Well, I, I think that's important. You know, I mean, we can prove, like, for example, that the Earth is round, you know. But if we couldn't prove it, if it was just a theory, you know, a centuries-old mm -hmm. theory without data to back that up, then that's why no one listened to the theory, you know, that the Earth was round because always the evidence. You know, because so science hadn't caught up. So you your know, theory... So kind of that, you're right. Your theory is following the scientific blood trail, basically. Yes, that's right. Just following the facts, following the data, and mm -hmm. then trying to see if that data can be inserted into a theory to, to give it weight. And, um, you know, I think when it comes to things like UFOs, that's really all we can do until, um, you know, we, we have a full picture of any of these issues, you know, whether Roswell or what's going on at Area 51 or what yeah. the face on Mars is. You know, we can look at all these things, we can study them, we can come to conclusions, but we need to recognize, you know, are we looking at this and saying it's, you know, the face on Mars is artificial because we've got proven facts, or is it a, because we want it to be real and we believe it to be real, which are, you know, different things. And I think it's important to point that out in a book like this as to where, you know, one area crosses over into another and where there's the, like, the goalposts between belief, theory, and, and what we know for sure. Okay, so then let me ask you this. If, okay, do you believe this as a theory... Do you believe in the existence of aliens visiting this Earth? Well, I believe in the existence of a genuine UFO phenomenon, but I believe in it because of the, the huge body of data, rather than me believing in the existence of a phenomenon for wanting to believe it. My, okay. my conc well, it's probably better to say I conclude that there's a UFO phenomenon based on the data. But no, I'm not actually, as people will know from my books, I'm not actually convinced that the entire unknown aspect of the UFO phenomenon is literally extraterrestrial. You know, if you look at things like quantum physics, which are allowing for the existence of multi-dimensions, maybe some of these things that we perceive as extraterrestrial are more sort of interdimensional. You know, I, I know that that's sort of a simplified term that gets bandied around a lot, but I mean... You know, I think our interpretation that they are literal extraterrestrial is is a conclusion um, or a theory. But, um, you know, we are in the book, you know, I talk about the extraterrestrial angle, but I also talk about things like the, the black eyed children and incubus and succubus being tied to all this, which a lot of cultures view in a far more sort of paranormal um, from a parallel perspective rather than extraterrestrial. So, you know, I'm open-minded on the origins of the UFO phenomenon, and there could be multiple unknown origins. You know, it doesn't necessarily just have to be extraterrestrial or interdimensional. We could be looking at a wide range of different phenomena. Sure, which is great, because you've done so much back work on this because you've crossed over into cryptozoology. So as you're researching this, I, I can imagine it's a little bit easier for you to integrate some of those other ideas because you have a good background in that. Well, you know, I, I mean, I'll be the first to be, I'm someone who's a lot of, a lot of ideas that I have don't sit well with a lot of people because I often think outside the box and a lot of people want all this sort of material all nicely compartmented here and there and they don't like it when I talk about people seeing Bigfoot vanishing in a flash of light or, you know, the UFO people don't like it when, you know, somebody gets abducted and they say they saw their dead grandmother or something on the UFO. You know, there are stories, rogue stories like that, that the UFO mm -hmm. community doesn't like to touch in the same way they don't like to touch stories where somebody said someone saw the Loch Ness Monster at the same time a UFO hovered over the lock, you know, which has actually happened. <laughs> um, but my view is that just because something's troubling and doesn't fit into normal accepted belief systems that the communities have, that's no reason to ignore it. So I guess it is easier for me than some people to tackle controversial subjects because I have no agenda to 
to push one theory. You know, I'll tell people, I'll write a book on this and I'll tell, write a book on that and say, look, this is what I've uncovered. I think mm-hmm. this is where it's leading. But 10 years from now, I might write a book that pushes that case in a totally different direction. And that's not like fence-sitting. I mean, it's being honest with your audience that if the data we have changes based on circumstances, we've got to tell people, you know, that if it's why it's changed and how it's changed and why something you accepted 10 years ago is no longer valid or, or still is valid, you know. Yeah, but well, while you're writing this book or even, you know, after you finish the book, did you uh, talk to anybody that is a scientist that is familiar with the RH positive negative theory and, and have a conversation with them and hear what they had to say? Yeah, I actually did. And mm-hmm. this was in relation to... Um, for example, some of the people who had written about the RH, neg- about RH negative blood, not for like UFO websites or articles, but for regular medicine-based, um, you know, articles. I mean, you can go to like medicine.com, WebMD, and things like that. You know, they've all got RH negative entries to tell people, particularly pregnant women, women about the you know the potential dangers if you're RH negative and you're pregnant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I spoke to a couple of people. I actually emailed probably about 15 people and got two replies. So um, they weren't sort of verbal conversations, but of the two who replied, they politely said that they didn't think the ET angle had any, any merit to it whatsoever. Right. Um, which was the response I ex- expected. You know, I don't um, expect, although, you know, I, I don't expect mainstream scientists, doctors, etc., to um, support the idea that, you know, the human bloodline has been manipulated by extraterrestrials. Um, I do wish sometimes, you know, that some, I actually, you know, I've spoken to a few scientists in the past in certain areas mm-hmm. who privately have said that, you know, they've looked at the UFO subject and felt, yes, there's definitely something to it, but they didn't feel they could ever stand up and say that because of their, you know, the whole peer system and and things like this and um, being brought on board to lecture, you know, for universities and that kind of thing. And to me, that's sort of uh, like a cowardly approach, you know, if someone actually believes something and they right. haven't, you know, they're worried to say so because of, well, it's going to affect how like, they pay next month's mortgage or whatever. No, I mean, that's, I don't have really have respect for people who believe something privately but are frightened to say it publicly, you know. So would you, um, would you actually now, say but, that maybe you're more objective than some of the scientists? Um, I or doctors? Say or... Ob- I wouldn't say, no, I wouldn't say I'm more objective. I would say I don't feel a need to apologize for having controversial theories and ideas and i don't you know i don't apologize for saying what i think when it comes to you know controversial areas um i mean i wrote a book like 10 years ago about roswell from the perspective of it being like a classified military experiment you know i'm not trying to sort of just fly my own flag but I don't know many people in ufology would do that. And I know several who told me privately they wouldn't because they'd be worried about the blowback from being told, well, we don't want you speaking at conferences again and we don't want you talking about this if you're going to say that about Roswell, you know, which is like the holy grail. But, you know, it didn't bother me. I didn't, I didn't worry about whether I was going to get kicked off the lecture circuit. I, mm-hmm. I did it because I felt it was an important story to tell. And I think, you know, the scientific community... Um, somebody who has a, a very sort of cherished belief in something and they've researched it heavily and they've done papers, peer review reports, things like that, um, they feel they have a lot to lose and they get very defensive. Well, to me, when you're de- dealing with definitive unknown stuff, like we all are in these type of subjects, you know, to put yourself in a position of saying Roswell was this or you know, there are 25 dead aliens stored at Area 51. Mm-hmm. You know, you cannot make statements like that without hard facts. You can say, according to data that I've got from person A, person B, and person C, it looks right. like this is what's going on, and I've got extra, you know, corroboration from this person that seems to back that up. That's all fine. But, you know, sci- a lot of scientists... So No, I don't feel I'm sort of more focused or... You know, etc. But I think it's more along the lines that 
you know, I don't feel I've got a reputation to lose, you know, so. <laughs> well, I, I would guess with our listeners, you actually have a good reputation going on here. And I'm not just saying that to, to pat you on the back, but well, um, I, I think that what well, you do is good. Well, I appreciate what you said, but yeah. what I meant by that was I don't feel, you know, I am I have any need to apologize for what I'm saying in terms of, of being controversial about a particular subject. I think... Um, when I say I don't have a reputation to lose, I guess what I mean is it doesn't, you know, it doesn't bother me what the comeback is because, you know, I, I'll just stand up and say what it, what it is I think. So, uh, well, I mean, I guess what's yeah, the point I of investigating if you're not just going to be honest about what you find? Well, yeah, I mean, that's all we can do. I mean, that's why in some of the things I've written about over the years, you know, I've... Um, I have to change my views. Um, you know, like the Rendlesham Forest case in England, mm -hmm. I sort of swing back and forth as to whether that was some was a genuine UFO or was it some sort of bizarre sort of uh, psychological warfare operation well, and well, actually military personnel. So. Yeah, yeah, on that, I mean, what, what makes you swing back and forth? More the the testimonials or the paper trail? What What is it that gets you going back and forth? A little bit of everything. I mean, I'll give you a quick rundown on Rendlesham, you know, mm -hmm. England's most famous UFO case, December 1980, when there were three nights of bizarre activity in Rendlesham Forest. Um, now, there are accounts, obviously, we know, of UFOs coming down and strange creatures, and it sounds like something straight out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And that may be exactly what it was. On the other hand, a few years ago, I interviewed um, a guy named Ray Boucher, who used to run the... Um, the uh, which, where was it? Uh, Nebraskan um, office of MUFON. And this was in the 1980s. And Ray Boucher told me how, in 1991, he met two Department of Defense physicists who told him that basically Rendlesham was like an experiment using sophisticated holograms to see how easily the human mind could be essentially, you know, um, f uh, fooled into believing it was seeing something solid when it was seeing essentially like a, a, a hall of mirrors, you know, holographic, uh, highly advanced holographic technology. And I've heard several other stories like this along the lines of when the guys were out in the woods at Rendlesham, the higher-up personnel weren't watching this um, amazing display. They'd all got their eyes on the, you know, the, the guys who were lower down the chain of command, the, the regular personnel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as if they were sort of gauging their response you know, how many people would be looking at the other guys? You'd be looking at the craft, but the reportedly the senior personnel were looking at the guys. So, you know, it's things like this, and it's it's suggestive of a, of a potential scenario. It doesn't prove anything, but, you know, that that's... But I know people who have, you know, widely held and tightly held beliefs in certain cases that they don't want to see those scenarios interrupted or disrupted, but you know, you you got to go where the evidence goes. It's no good just clinging on to a cool case because, or a cool scenario because it sounds good and you love it. You know. It's, well, that's got that's got to be one of the more. Really. Yeah, that's got to be one of the more frustrating aspects of ufology because if you're you're talking to somebody and you're using your uh, BS radar, um, and you, they're telling you something and you believe in them you know the, you you get that sense okay these guys are telling the truth but what can you really do with that well yeah i mean th this is one of the issues with ufology you know we get a lot of really good credible stories from people and um you know the, the problem is with a lot of this subject is actually proving something i mean we have numerous highly credible people who, who claim to have seen alien bodies at Roswell and you yeah. know this strange memory metal and the, but the problem is after 70 years we don't even have a scrap of undeniable alien metal yes people have come forward with fragments of this and fa fragments of that but I can assure you if, if one of them had been proved 100% extraterrestrial it would have been all over the news you know it, but we don't have it we don't have a definitive photograph of the bodies ever. Nothing's ever. There's never been a ufological Edward Snowden. You know, there's. Right. Well, the there have. I mean, there have been some really good photographs. I mean, uh, oh, you no, know, there's good pictures of UFOs. But what we don't have, and, and there's great testimony, but we don't have, unfortunately, 
is the equivalent of, you know, sort of a, a hobbit skeleton. Or right. we don't have the body of a frozen mammoth to prove when mammoths existed and where they roamed. Um, and that's the problem we face in all of these sort of UFOs, Bigfoot, you name it. We don't have a corpse. And, um, and I think it's things like that that, until we do, it's always going to be, well, you know, Maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and, until we actually get our hands on the on the hard evidence. But you know, all we can do is sort of keep pushing and 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 share the information we've got, and hopefully, people will look at it with an open mind um, and see, well, you know, if they feel it's got it can be vindicated or not. So. Yeah, well, I mean, like you said, ten, you know, fifteen years ago, people. Uh, you know, would not have expected so many species of human to have been found. And then it kind of makes me wonder, maybe maybe there is actually hope of finding some sort of skeleton or some sort of remains of something not human and not from this planet. Well, I mean, it's it's not impossible. I mean, you know, everybody talks about the, the Holy Grail. To, to prove all this would be the bodies from the Roswell crash. Well, mm -hmm. as, you know, as many people believe, aliens have been visiting us from tens and tens of thousands of years ago, I mean, what are the chances of that one of, it just one didn't die in an accident in the middle of nowhere and the body wasn't recovered? You know, we, we kind of focus on, oh, well, there were five bodies at Roswell or four bodies at Roswell. If only we could find them. Well, you know, maybe we should be looking elsewhere. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that, that, yeah, I have a feeling, oh, that's a good point, yeah. I, I have a feeling that we're not, we're not going to find those bodies. Well, we probably won't, but, you know, I mean, it's a situation, it's kind of like the Hobbit one. I mean, we didn't find those, you know, um, for until in the 21st century. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's, there's so wait, plenty Nick, of do you think, for us to do you, find things, you know. But do you think that all the bodies were collected or that there was perhaps something overlooked? Oh, well, you mean with Roswell? Roswell, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I think that... Um, if anything got left behind, um, you know, we probably would have known about it if one of the ranchers or whoever had scooped up a decomposing body or whatever. Um, the, I think the only possibility with Roswell is, I mean, I've actually been out to the real crash site. I say the real one because various different places have been put forward. But um, I went out there about, I think it was 2011, and one of the interesting things is that round there, you know, there have been like, a, there are like a lot of animal dens and tunnels, you know, rabbits and things like that. And I mean, who knows, maybe 70 years ago, something got blown down, you know, one of these little rabbit holes or whatever. And, you know, I don't think it's actually possible that there could have been something that wasn't picked up, you know, a bit yeah. of wreckage and... Um, and that would, if it still exists, you know, it could be ironic, just four feet underground wedged into some rat's tunnel or whatever, you know. And yeah, yeah. nobody knows, but it might be just under our feet. So I don't think, you know, it's, we should take the approach that, oh, we might as well just give up because we're not going to find it. One of the things I've always said to people about Roswell is that I actually think, I don't think the answer is going to come through disclosure. And... Um, I think if it's going to surface, nor do I think it's going to come from aliens themselves, because I don't see any evidence that they ever want to disclose who or what they are. What I personally think is that the answer will come by an error, or well, not necessarily by an error, uh, by an, an alternative means that nobody would have anticipated. I mean, to go back to Snowden, you know, regardless of what people think of Edward Snowden, who would have thought that the NSA's biggest secret, you know, the large-scale collection of everybody's social media and landline, you know, who you call in, etc. Who would have believed that, you know, some young guy, 29 or whatever he was, would blow the whistle and in the story would erupt across the entire planet? Who would have believed that three months before it actually happened? Probably no one. Yeah. Most people wouldn't have even believed it was going on. Um, but it was, and it did come out. And I think that's what could happen with Roswell, is that it could come out via some unforeseen means that we don't, or we haven't been able to anticipate, you know. And um, could it happen? Well, you know, things do happen, so so maybe. Yeah. I mean, these spelunkers, they found these remains. It wasn't scientists going out looking for them. 
So mm-hmm. it makes me think, actually, I know we're going off subject here a little bit, but about Bigfoot, for instance, I mean, maybe the idea is wrong here. Maybe going out there and trying to hunt one down or trying to make contact one is the wrong approach. Maybe just really hard work looking for remains or, you know, checking out little holes and, and digging. I, I don't know. Maybe that's the better way. Well, yeah, I mean, things like, I think any any approach is a good approach, providing I think people don't limit themselves to, you know, a statement they've made that they can't back away from. That That's the problem. You know, I, as, I've, I mean, I've had this before, so slightly to go back what I said earlier about mm-hmm. people said, oh, you're sitting on the fence because you said, well, maybe this, maybe that, and then you suggested another theory in another book. Eight, well, that's nine, what, that's what quantum physicists do all the time, right? Yeah, but for some reason, within ufology, it's almost like there's an 11th commandment, which is like, thou shalt not change thy opinion, you know. Yeah. It's like one person, you know, this is the alien abduction researcher, he's the crop circle investigator, she's the one who thinks it all, it's all demons, he's yeah. the one who thinks time travel has crashed at Roswell, she's the one who thinks, you know, it's people from, from the past or whatever, and... And for some weird reason, within ufology, it's almost like people look down on you if you dare to change your opinion on something. I thought, well, you wrote a book saying this. Well, yeah, 10 years ago, when we had only half the witnesses that we have today. Um, And so, and I just don't get that. I don't understand why ufology takes that approach that, uh, well, you said this, you said that. Um, And I think... Well, you know... Uh, what I think, what I don't like about what happens to researchers like yourself, um, is that you, you'll get knocked right in the in, in the maybe mainstream media and scientists, um, but the larger the public at large, um, they watch shows like Ancient Aliens or movies, and they, they have a fascination. Whether they believe in it totally or not, I think most people are open minded to these ideas at, at the very least. Well, yeah, I mean, the one good thing, certainly in today's world, is that, you know, there's a far more greater level of coverage um, in the UFO subject and other mysteries than there was, say, 25 years ago. I mean, there's, you know, there's been coverage on UFOs since 1947. You know, Kenneth Arnold cited and Roswell were front page news. Um, and yep. but the media has always had this approach where, They'll cover the subject, but I've actually mentioned this in an article I wrote just recently. Um, you know, there's never been sort of coverage given to something like Roswell that was applied to, say, the investigation of Watergate or Iran-Contra or something like that. There's never mm-hmm. been a serious, you know, 18-month-long probe by one of the, main, the most powerful mainstream media outlets on the planet, that kind of thing. You know, it's always a story of page seven with a few sarcastic comments and and then a brief summary of the case and perhaps a little few things that support the story, but then the official line comes along as to why, you know, it's not this or it's not that. Um, and so to sort of, you know, get, get to your point about, um, you know, people sort of criticizing you for this and criticizing for that. I mean, you know, all we can do is sort of, with the media, is give them the data, you know, that we have and hope they make a good production out of it. Now, certainly, I would say in the early 2000s, up to the early 2000s, you know, we actually to the mid-2000s, we saw a resurgence in some really good shows which were actually done well, which you know, question the official line that it's just a weather balloon or a satellite. And they were, they were well made. But unfortunately, the tables turned a little bit today. Whereas in the past, we had sort of debunking and skeptical articles and poking fun at the UFO researchers. And then we had this sort of brief period in the first decade of this century when we actually had a really good, you know, body of TV shows. What we're getting now is the dumbed down reality shows. And I can tell you, I do a lot of paranormal and UFO TV. Mm-hmm. And I can also tell you with absolutely no doubt that, you know, some of the shows that I know are out there, they're not sort of inspired by real things or dramatized. No, that they, they're hoaxing things. You know, Wait, I can show, tell you... Shows that, that you're on or other shows or you're just saying in general? No. I actually, well, I actually was asked to do one show. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, no, this has happened several times, and I've turned them all down, because I always make my 
position clear is that, you know, I'll tell you what I think. Um, we can go out to the sides. But, you know, I've had people who... Actually, one show I did, it was actually nothing to do with the UFOs. It was actually a Bigfoot show. Mm-hmm. And they said that the, the cameraman, uh, his equipment was too heavy for us to go up this one particular mountain where Bigfoot was supposedly been seen. And they said, so we're going to pretend that this small sort of, I don't know what it was, like a 200 foot tall hill was the mountain. And I refused, okay. you know, because they wanted me to say, here we are at whatever the mountain, you know, so-and-so mountain looking for Bigfoot. And I said, well, I'm not doing that because we're not on the mountain. And they thought I was just being, <laughs> you know, I was just being uh, um, just stubborn for the point that I wasn't. Or, yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually know uh, of another show where they actually, I wasn't on this one, but um, it was a, a, another Bigfoot show where they had like one of the crew shaking the trees and they just asked the actors, you know, oh that's what I call them, um, you know, can you say what the hell was that? And no, you know, yeah, that, that's, that was. That's, I mean, that, forget about your credibility if any of that gets out. But I mean, how yeah, do well, you feel about it thing, yourself, yeah. your own integrity? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, unfortunately, that's, we're going more and more in that direction today. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe they were shaking the tree. Yeah. Down. yeah, like reality type that's crazy. Um, shows. Now, what the best one for me it wasn't a UFO subject, but it was Monster Quest, which was the History Channel show mm-hmm. in the 2000s. I think it ran for about five series. For me, sure. that was the best example of a show where you had researchers of things like Bigfoot or Mothman or Lake Monsters going out to locations followed by a film crew and actually film doing the investigation. But so many of them today, there's, they just don't even bother doing an investigation. They just roll into town, find somewhere where there's some woods, and like I said, have somebody shake the trees, you know, somebody else make a plas- you know, a fake footprint, and that's the investigation, and it's become more about dumbed-down entertainment. And I actually yeah, think that's... we're going towards, with the mainstream media and the paranormal today, yeah. I think we're going towards a worse scenario than we were in when the media laughed at us. Because although they laughed at us, at least they reported honestly on what we were saying, even if they didn't believe it. You know, today, you can't even believe what you see on half of these shows. Yeah, I mean, if you're that desperate to have a show, I mean, why don't you just do a different show? It seems a bit, well, a bit ludicrous. Well, right. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I do a lot of TV shows, paranormal, Bigfoot, UFO stuff, but equally, I turn down so much as well. Um one of the reasons being, you know, they want to tie you up in ridiculous contracts. Um, they try and tell me what to wear. I even had one show said, you know, you've got to take your earring out because it'll affect credibility. <laughs> well. and, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that one, it made me like as mad as it made me just almost roll over laughing. You know, mm, you want well. me to talk about Bigfoot and you're worried about what the viewers are going to think about the fact that I've got an earring. You know what I mean? It's like, it's so surreal, you know. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that also reflects their their ignorance and their totally being outdate, outdated. It's, I mean, times have changed. Well, it's not, you know, it's I same. mean, but, but that's what you're up against with a lot of these yeah. TV shows. Um they, you know, they arrogantly want you to do this. And they expect, you know, if they pay your fee, that you're going to just say right, right. this or say that. And um, and they, sometimes they're like dumbstruck of what? You're not prepared to lie. You know, as if, like, well, surely you are, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, and I guess, I guess from their perspective, they perhaps don't even think you're that serious about what you do. That you know that it's it's just something that you do to to make money or something like that. So they well, probably just yeah. underestimate you. Well, maybe yeah, maybe that is the case. But even so, I mean, you know, it's it doesn't reflect well on them at all when they come along and just expect that you know. I mean, it demonstrates that they just don't really do much background checking, you know, before they phone somebody up and say, yeah. you know can you come and do this? I mean, and again, that kind of makes you think, well, what about all the other shows that they're producing? History shows or, you know, something on the history of the Second World War or a medical show. Who knows what, you know, they're going to be working on after this one. How much of that's fabricated or distorted? But um, I think it's just more an outgrowth of just the sort of reality TV world. People want, 
you know, people we aren't want. Don't miss a great offer on an incredibly fast Files triple play. Click the banner to get 150 meg internet, TV, and phone for only $79.99 per month for the first year. Plus, you'll get a $150 Visa prepaid card with a two-year agreement. It's your last chance to get this amazing offer before it's gone. Reality TV, and unfortunately, more and more of them don't care if it's real reality or if it's constructed reality. Mm. You know, it's just just the way the world is today, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that's why they have shows for improv, you know? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, a, I mean, essentially what it is, right? I mean... Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, there's um, there's a lot of good things about, you know, the, the world when it comes to ufology today. I mean, there's no doubt that the the impact of the internet, you know, sort of last, certainly the last 18, 17, 18 years, and definitely the last 15 years, has really opened up the UFO subject on a massive scale. And I don't think at all that the sheer level of TV shows um, on the paranormal, good or bad, would exist were it not for the fact that people within these fields were able to get more, far more um, coverage uh, and noticeability through um, because to the internet. So, in other words, you know, there have been a lot of positive developments, but the problem is, you know, keeping things in check so they remain positive developments in the subject. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, people sometimes get surprised when I say that I think one of the best things about the publishing world is now that anyone can put a book out themselves. You know, I had people say, somebody once said to me, well, don't you think as an author, you know, your book should be published by reputable publishing and companies and all this, you know, they're mm-hmm. totally full of ego. It was a guy who had this sort of, I'm an author, you know, I'm someone special, this kind of thing. He had that sort of attitude. And I was like, well, no, I mean, for me, the fact that anybody and everyone can put out their own book, you know, whether in, in a book format or an e-version, and they can have their own ideas, their own thoughts, you know, they're not governed by some publisher or editor saying, oh, well, this isn't one for us, go away. You know, that in the old days, you wouldn't be able to get your book published. I, I think it's, you know, one of the best things ever that anybody in today's world can be an author. And, you know, we're not, no one's forced to buy their books if they think it's garbage and if you want to buy it, that's fine. But I think, you know, that I think it's a good thing that, that anyone can get a book out there. You know, God forbid yeah. the day comes when we're not allowed to <laughs> write books, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other topic. Yeah, but, um, but I think that, that you're right. You're right. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with, generally speaking, new ideas and just keep them coming. Why not? If people have an idea, get it out there. Um, and if you're just tuning in to Inception Radio Network, Epic Voyages Radio, we are talking to Nick Redfer and our guest tonight, and his book is Bloodline of the Gods, Unravel the Mystery in the Human Blood Type to Reveal the Aliens Among Us. So, Nick, the, um, the uh, RH positive, that mm-hmm. is what's considered the norm. So that's why 85% to 90% of the population. Um, what, where do you think, looking in your research, the actual 10 to 15% of the RH negative where did, where did that come into play? Where's the evidence well, for you? Yeah. Well, that, that's a good question. I mean, the important thing that we can say for sure is that, you know, there is, this is the most important thing, is that there is, there is a small percentage of the population whose blood mm-hmm. is very different to the rest of the population. I think right. that's the most important thing to remember, is that, you know, that's not hearsay or rumor or interpretation. That's fact. I mean, basically, there are there are four... Uh, key types of blood, and they're A, B, AB, and O. And um, the classifications come from what are called the antigens of a person's blood cells, and antigens are proteins Mm -hmm. found on the surface of cells. Now, in terms of today's world, so people have an idea, in the US, um, but 85 to 87, depending on whose statistics you read, but around about 85 to 87, all US Caucasians um, are what's called RH positive. That's to say they have this particular antigen in their blood. Um, for African Americans, it's about 89 to 91% are RH positive, and so about 8 or 9% are negative and about 1% to 2% of Asian Americans uh, are H-negative. Now, 
the interesting question, of course, is why, if we're all, you know, homo sapien, why is it that there should even be a small percentage of the population that lacks this particular antigen? Well, Nick, now, actually, let me just interrupt you really fast right there before you go on. Is, are there any groups that are to that that are excluded out of this statistic, that the entire group is just RH positive? No, actually, that's a good point. No, there isn't. No. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, because you, you can have, like, for example, you know, like typo negative, typo positive, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Mm -hmm. But, um, and there's actually no sort of, you know, group of, uh, you know, whether Caucasian, African American, Asian American. Um, mm -hmm. There are different um, groups of people around the world that have higher and lower levels, some significantly higher uh, levels, but there's no one who's sort of specifically 100% excluded. Now, the the RH factor, as it's called, the RH is derived from the rhesus macaque, or as it's now the, the rhesus monkey. Um, right. And so inevitably, in, in other words, it's essentially a case of, you know, looking at our lineage um, and, and essentially, you know, our origins. So in other words, why is it that a small percentage of us should um, lack this sort of this rhesus factor? And that's a question that, you know, science obviously accepts it, um, but very few people actually look into why that should have been the case in the first place. You know, there's a, a solid body within the medical community that fully understands how certain issues, you know, relating to RH negative blood and pregnancy, for example, can be quite hazardous, and they know how to combat it. And but they don't really look into why the issue exists in the first place, you right. know. Well, and I wanted to ask you about that, the, the rhesus mon monkey connection. So how does that work in with our, with our evolution, our, our lineage? Why, why the rhesus monkey? Well, I mean, the, well, the, one of the most important things to note is that um, the, the macaque, the rhesus macaque or the rhesus monkey, actually mm -hmm. has a DNA sequence that is 93% identical to that of the human race. Okay. And that's why so much of the uh, medical experimentation that's done to try and understand human disease and combat it is actually mm -hmm. undertaken on rhesus monkeys because we are so close. And... Um, for example, the, the rhesus monkey has actually been used um, essentially as like a model for more than 70 human infectious diseases. Um, that includes like bacteria, fungi, viruses, prions, mm -hmm. and um, all sorts of different diseases. The, the rhesus monkey is used so much because, you know, as I said, DNA-wise, they're 93%. Not similar or alike, but absolutely identical to us. It's just that 7% that makes us so different. But 93, you know, is pretty high. And so, again, the big question is that why should some of the population not be, um, not have that um, close tie-in to the rhesus monkeys that the rest of the 92, 93% of the population does have? Okay. All right. So then, so I understand that. So where does the um, RH negative come in now? Right. Well, that sort of gets to the crux of things. Now, I mentioned um, that the, sm the percentage of people who, who are RH negative mm -hmm. is sort of at 8 9%. Okay. However, for the Basque people in Spain and France, that's B-A-S-Q-U-E, the Basque people, their figures, depending on the area and the time frame and the number of people, has varied from sort of 45 to about 58, 59, 60 percent. And the interesting thing is that where we have areas of so-called hot spots, if you like, where RH negative figures are higher, there are also areas where Cro-Magnon man proliferated in the distant past. And... Mm -hmm. um, this is interesting because when you look at the correlations and we add that add something else to that, namely the fact that if you look at the um, the Basque people, they look very different to a lot of the other people in Europe. They have sort of like a heavier brow, more pronounced and wider nose, mm -hmm. a powerful looking jaws. They have their naturally built, sort of more muscular and bulky. And they have their own unique language, which has no similarities with any other European language whatsoever. 
you know, I mean, I'm originally from England, but you can find mm-hmm. some words in you know, the French language and the German language which are very similar to the English language. The Basque language, however, has no similarities with anything at all. So there's a great deal of data that puts the Basque people in a unique position. And a lot of scientists that have looked at the, the Basque people, their DNA, have suggested that they are sort of a, the closest modern-day I guess offshoot would be the right term to use, of the cro magnons And mm-hmm. so for a lot of this, we can, make, uh, we can make an assumption, which, you know, is important to point out that it is an assumption, but make an assumption or a theory that the RH neg- the, excuse me, the Cro-Magnons were RH negatives. And um, because of the proliferation of area, the similarities with the Basques, et cetera, et cetera, and, and other hot spots as well. And um, so that then begs the question, why should Cro-Magnon man have been um, RH negative if, if Cro-Magnon man was RH negative? This brings us to the theories that have been put forward um, in the so-called ancient astronaut community, um, the idea of Cro-Magnon man possibly being manipulated genetically in the distant past by visiting extraterrestrials. And, of course, you know, as I pointed out as the uh, sort of the, the start of the show, um, the importance of demonstrating what's a theory versus what we know. And one of the things I point out in the book is to, you know, to, to look at the theory that um, ancient man could have been genetically altered and then see if there's anything to support this. And, you know, you can look back to many ancient biblical texts um, which talk about, for example, you know, interaction between the gods and man and, you know, the, the gods coming down and mating with the human women. And then you have these stories of, like, the, god, the men of renown and the Nephilim. And, you know, you, again, it comes down to interpretation, but you can sort of put, one person could put, like, a religious um, angle on this. Somebody mm-hmm. else could suggest, well, this sounds actually like a distorted story of bizarre genetic manipulation or interaction between two different species and then having this, you know, sort of strange combined offshoot, so to speak. So uh, that sort of takes, you know, the book to the early stages of how and why there could have been, you know, a genetic manipulation and and tie it in with these ancient stories of, you know, the gods coming down and there being like a a connection between us and them. Well, that's what I wonder is... um where did they come in first? Do you know? Was it one? Was it maybe a, a line through the Neanderthals that was bred into us, or from another, you know, a species? Well, yeah. I mean, that, that's a, again an interesting question because again we're dealing with so many issues that we're not a hundred percent sure on. I mean, what we mm-hmm. do know for sure is that Crow Magnon man, you know, was was a highly evolved creature. I think you know a lot of people, particularly when you're at school as a kid, you told about cavemen so-called caveman, we have this image of the guy, you know, long hair and the bare skin clothes, you know, with a big long club in his left hand and dragging his wife back to the cave by the hair in the other hand, you know. That's the image a lot of people have of cavemen. But, I mean, Crow Magnon Man and the Andalfer Man, their brains are actually larger than ours, significantly larger. We know that Crow, uh, Crow Magnon Man... Um, had, had music. We know from some fragments of tools and things that have been found that they're highly suggestive of early string instruments. Um, we know they had an understanding of the concept of death and its implications, uh, burial rites. Um, we know they lived in families. Um, and Crow Magnum remains have been found, for example, on isolated islands. And this has given rise to the fairly incredible but probably likely scenario that they had boats of some kind, you mm-hmm, know, yeah. probably not talking about huge ships or anything like that, obviously, but certainly probably rudimentary boats or something along those lines. So when you put all those issues together, we're dealing with the, the, the I won't say the sudden rise, but the very, you know, fairly sudden rise of a particular line of humans that was significantly advanced, that had bigger brains than ours, that were more robust, they were fitter, they were skilled hunters, they were very skilled artists, and who, you know, essentially were our superiors in many respects. The only 
way they were superior was in technology. Um, did you say, did you say they had bigger, bigger brains or the same size? No, no, Crow Magnaman's brain was like the size of, well, not quite the size of a baseball bigger, but it was, you know, sort of half the size of a baseball bigger than our brains. Um, and so, in other words, you know, we're looking at these different types of human that proliferated like Crow Magnaman. But what was weird is that Neanderthal man didn't survive. Now, there have been theories about, you know, a wipeout or a virus, or that it got just sort of absorbed into you know, um, what eventually became us. Okay, Nick, I'm going to cut you off there real fast. We're uh, going into a break. Everybody hang in there. This is Epic Voyages Live. Your host, Alan B. Smith, and we'll be back in just a bit.